Savvy Central Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with host Christina Nichman. The AME Experience is a collection of media outlets determined to bring art awareness and appreciation to the community. We cover all kinds of art from traditional to cultural. We cover entertainment news and take you up close and personal to places of interest to visit art, celebrities, and more. Join us for our TV show, radio show, and magazine. We are always looking for talented artists and celebrities to cover. Our goal is to raise money for grants to help those interested in a career in the arts. Art is a great way to express yourself without joining gangs or any other destructive behavior. Be a part of the movement and get inspired at AME Experience at theamemagazine.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Savvy Central Radio. This is your host, Christina Nichman. Each week, Savvy runs weekly broadcasts providing entrepreneurs and successful individuals a platform to express their dreams, hopes, lessons learned, expertise, and wisdom with the world. Our guest today is Amy Scott Grant. MBA, Master Intuitive Healer, why do people around the globe connect with this hillvoyant, master healer, and two-time best-selling author? In a word, it's clarity. Amy has an uncanny knack for going straight to the root of an issue to get you clear. The experience of working with Amy is not only powerfully effective, but fast. Today, Amy joins us to talk about money blocks, what's stopping you from making money that you want in your business, and having the success you desire. Find out more about Amy at AskAmyAnything.com. Hi, Amy. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. How are you? I'm awesome, Christina. Thanks for having me out today. Well, I'm always happy to have and meet new people on Savvy. And you are going to come on and talk about a subject that gets a lot of airtime and a lot of requests, and that is around money and money mindset. You've done a whole video series on it. But before we get started with that, you have a quite a background, quite a journey. Your current path as a best-selling author and master intuitive healer. Share with our audience how that all came about for you. Oh, you know, my story is probably the same as anyone's, right? I was born <laughs> psychic and uh, <laughs> right. that was not well received by my extremely conservative Catholic family. <laughs> so probably about the age of nine or 10, um, you know, so I had this particular knowing that was kind of disturbing to my parents. And so it was not well received and I just shut it down. So I tried to block out my intuition, the things that I knew and, you know, I tell people it's it's a funny thing happens when you deny who you really are. It's like things just start crumbling and falling apart. So I had actually made multiple suicide attempts by the time I was 13 and uh, was just feeling like I did not belong in this world. Like nobody gets me. You know, this is just what is the point? Right. And then this book kind of randomly fell into my life and I started kind of changing the way that I thought about things and the way that I looked at things. And um, I don't know. And then I guess I decided it was all going to be OK. Right. So still was like secret. You know, it was all in secret. I don't think anybody is like a little kid. And they're like, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a psychic. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Nobody wants that kind of publicity. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like if you have that kind of gift, you know, you, as a kid, you naturally share everything. And then you find out, hmm, OK, this, that was not well received. So let me like play it kind of cool. Right. So, yeah, I think I was kind of a closet intuitive for probably, I don't know, maybe 15 years, something like that. And then one day I just decided, you know what, I don't really care because it's much easier to just be yourself and put it out there than it is to try and be who you think people want you to be, right? Which is yeah. like impossible to please. So yeah. yeah, so I guess I came out of the spiritual closet about sometime in the last probably five or 10 years. And so that's been just like a oh, lot easier, right? Yeah. <laughs> easier yeah. to live and easier to help people and do what you came here to do, you know, when you can just stop apologizing and trying to hide it, right? Yeah, I, I love that you say it came out of the spiritual closet. I never heard it quite said like that. But it's interesting. I, I just had a past guest on that talk just about how the innate gifts and talents that we're born with, they're, they're vast. And a lot of us hide those gifts, especially if they're in the realm of spirituality and, you know, you have intuitive gifts and such. And we think, oh, no, 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 that doesn't match in modern world or in our modern society. And so you hide it. And it's just so sad because those things are so pure and natural when you're a child. 
But you know what? I, I think there's a maturity that comes with it. You know, if you think, hey, we're talking about money today, so let's just yeah. map this onto money. If you've ever known anybody who grew up with money, especially if you knew them like when you were kids, when you were teens, when you were in your 20s, yeah. at some point they probably were a total jerk, right? And I'm not stereotyping people with money, but I'm saying, you know, <gasps> kids that grow up with a sense of privilege, they have the privilege, but they don't have the maturity uh. to handle it, right? And so they kind of go through, you know, their jackass stage and whatever. And, you know, many people outgrow that. And then they develop maturity around money and they realize, oh, this is a blessing. This is an yeah. asset. This is a benefit. This is a tool that I can use to make an impact, to help people, to make a difference, to, you know, help my family, to further people in the world and whatever. So I think that's true of any kind of gift as well, whether your gift is singing or public speaking or, you know, spiritual healing yeah. or bringing out the best in people, like as a radio, you know, as a <laughs> person that interviews people, right? There's skills that go along with that. So, but you, it's like, you never just come out of the gate on fire, right? Yeah. Like there's yeah. sort of this learning curve that you have to go through. And so I think that's true of anything. Yeah, I get you there. I get you there. And so often, while a lot of the gifts might be something not well received, as you said, as a child, as we continue to grow in maturity, then our gifts can start, we can start exploring our gifts and talents and say, okay, how am I meant to use these in the world? Now, talking about your money mindset videos that you have out there, you mentioned a number of ways people stand in the way of their success and missed opportunities from not acting immediately, from not signing up for opportunities that come in their come their way. Why is money such a, a weird wonky thing that get in the way of people just really living their full glorious selves? Well, what is it about money in particular, that idea? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think part of it is there's so much emotion and attachment that we all have wrapped up in money. You know, it's not like we, when we start to get introduced to money as kids, there's different circumstances in which it's introduced, right? So maybe the first time that you were exposed to money was when you got an allowance and then you thought, oh, okay, so I work hard. I have to do a bunch of stuff I don't like to do because no kid likes their chores, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to do all the stuff I don't want to do and then I get some money, but then there's this thing I want, so I have to save for it or I spend all my money and then there's not enough to go to the movies or to do what I want to do. So we start learning at an early age and of course, our parents, God love them, are just doing the best that they can, yeah. right? So they're inadvertently passing on their own money crap to you, right? And their hangups and their issues. And, and I've seen both sides of the spectrum on this where you've got parents that, you know, uh, want their children to understand that life is hard and you don't get everything handed to you on a silver platter. And no, you can't have that because that costs money and we don't have that. But then I've seen people all the way at the other side of the spectrum that want to shield and protect their children from anything related to money so they don't ever talk about it. Yeah. So then all of a sudden the kid gets a job and can't manage money because no one's ever talked to them about help money and how it works. And then of course there's everything in between. So I think a lot of these hangups that we have around money start as children. A lot of them go way back, even predating this lifetime. We bring in issues and traumas and old betrayals and stuff with us. And so all of that's hanging around. So there's a ton of emotion. There's a lot of attachment too. And you know, I, it's really funny because if you think about how money started, it's kind of mind blowing, <laughs> right? Like I went, so here in Denver, we have one of, I think, I think there's only five or six U.S. mints left in the country. And one of them is in Denver and you can go and take a tour and <laughs> it's free, but there's like a six month wait, right? So you have to book like six months in advance to go take this free tour. Yeah. And I thought this will be something good for the kids, right? So we all signed up and and there's this little room that you wait in while you're waiting for the tour to begin. And they have some old artifacts and things and some little sort of like, you know, museum type displays in that room. And I sat there and stared at these little wooden beads that have been painted blue. And I thought, are you freaking kidding me? Like, can you imagine being the first guy that he's like, OK, so I'm going to take your goat. And I'm going to give you these blue beads, right? Which you can now take to market and buy meat and milk and like whatever else. 
I can't even imagine like how hard that must have been to introduce such a concept. You know, today it's so it's so nat like it's so commonplace. We don't think about it. You know, if somebody hands you a 20, it's a $20 bill. You don't even look at it unless something looks funny about it, right? You go, oh, okay, it's a 20. And then you go pay for something else for $20, whatever. Yeah. So paper has become such a norm of medium. And half the time, we don't even use paper, right? Yeah. We're using plastic. We're doing stuff online. Now there's the Apple Pay and the swipes and all this stuff. But back then, it, it became impractical to barter everything, right? Because, well, I only want to give you half of the cow, you know, or whatever. Like, they, they, you have to come up with another way. So it started with these little blue beads, which I just find, like, amazing. And you think, you know, if we as a human race carry these racial memories and these racial histories, at some point, we had to have gotten screwed somewhere along the line with these blue beads, right? Because who could remember, like, what size? was? There was no numbers on them or anything. Like, we have such a standardized method today. And think about if you ever go to a foreign country, you know, you stand there like an idiot for a few minutes because you're trying to get used to the money and figure out what's worth. And you try, you know, what, what is this and what denomination you're trying to convert in your head and all this kind of stuff. That's what it would have been like all the time when money first came out. So I think our issues with money are pretty ancient and go far back. But a lot of what's hanging around today, mm -hmm. in addition to all that old stuff, is the attachment, right? We want it. We want more of it. So there's this sense of need, this sort of mindset like, I got to get, you know, I got to get, I got to keep. There's never enough. There's all of that kind of stuff going on, too. Mm -hmm. And that is so fascinating to me, the idea that they were just blue beads trading for um, whatever you might need, trading it about, and, and how that must be in the back of our psyche somewhere in, in humankind that, you know, it, it just boggles my imagination. Now, today, with all the other things that tie us up from there's not enough or and, and stuff like that, how does anyone even begin, whether a business owner or just a person in your life, begin to unravel what some of those blocks for you might be with regards to money and, and all of that? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, there's there's a ton of common ones, mm -hmm. right? And it's the things that you know, or have become cliche. Well, they only become cliche because people say them all the freaking time, right? So that's how you could easily start with that type of list. Like money doesn't grow on trees and I'm not made of money and, um, you know, whatever, a day late and a dollar short. I mean, there's tons of like idioms, right, about money. But the easiest way for an individual to figure out what their biggest money hangups are are to listen to the words that come out of your mouth. Your language is very telling, right? Pun intended. Your language is telling. And so if you listen to the types of things that you say, you can start to get some insight into what's really buried and what's going on there. You know, um, and that might be like, you might not even be talking about money, but you might use terms that relate to money. For example, let's say, let's say you need to go to the DMV and you're thinking, man, I cannot afford to sit at the DMV for three hours today. Yeah. That didn't have anything to do with money. It had to do with time. And yet you still affirmed cannot afford. Uh -huh. So it's like the subconscious does not delineate like, oh, you were talking about time and only time and that's it. And we can afford everything else. Fine. <laughs> no, cannot afford is cannot afford. Right. So mm -hmm. and there's tons of expressions like that, you know, or if you're constantly saying things like, you know, I worry or whatever. And you may not even think you're a worrier, but you may say it something like, you know, I'm worried that we won't make it to the movies on time. You might not feel worried, but that is what's coming out of your mouth. So again, if worry is present, you're probably going to, and that's something that you say often, you're probably going to find that you have worry around money because it's something that's present in your field and it's coming out naturally in your language. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And for me, that that's for very telling in that uh, when I first met my partner, uh, we've been together nine years, we started with a writing back and forth relationship through letters. And it was it's interesting what comes up when you write to someone else and are able to see things from their perspective of what you're writing. And I think it must have been about two months into our letter writing. And he was like, my gosh, you're the most scared, frightful person I've ever talked to. And I was really baffled. What are you talking about? I'm not frightful. I'm not nervous. He's like, well, you know, you use the word nervous, fearful, scared. 
afraid in every single letter. Mm-hmm. And I, I was I was floored. I had no idea. So, I mean, I'm sure some of those same ideas were coming across when I speak as well as when I write. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It's, it's amazing what comes out of our mouths, right? And it's, if you consider that every time you open your mouth, you are creating something with the words that you use, but we don't, right? We just blah, blah, blah. We just <laughs> talk all the time. Yeah. Not a thought in our head, or we have one thought and a thousand words come pouring out around that thought, right? So, but if you consider that every time you speak, you are creating something, that really helps you to become present to what you're choosing in terms of your language. And then, you know, if you hear something coming out of your mouth, that's not what you want. Like, let's say somebody invites you to go to a concert or go on a trip and you think you think you would love to do it, but you don't have the money. So you might catch yourself saying something like that, right? Like, man, I would love to go, but I can't, right? (laughs) Stop yourself as quick as you can, you might get the whole sentence out. I can't afford it. Or you might just get to, I can't, when you realize what you're about to say, then you can actually just say, cancel, cancel Mm -hmm. and phrase it in a different way, right? Like maybe you'll say, um, you know what, I will work on getting the money so I can go on that with you. Or I would love to do that with you next time that band is in town, you know, or, or whatever it is, but to say it in a more positive way than to keep constantly affirming that you have money problems, right? Because that is definitely not the way to get them to go away. Let me tell you. Yeah. So by doing that, by reaffirming what you'd like, the reality you'd like to see in your life, does that really start to actually transform what you see in your everyday reality? Well, I'm going to be honest with you, Christina. It is, it will, but it is definitely the slow boat to China approach. (laughs) Okay. Like affirmations are all great and good. And I'm sorry if you just watch The Secret, if you're listening and you got all excited. It's like, yes, it works, but it takes freaking forever and it requires a ton of repetition, which I personally have a low tolerance for. Mm. That's why I make so many videos because I don't like to say the same thing twice. So I'll just put it on a video and go, there you go. Yeah. But um, yeah, so affirmations do work, but they take a really long time. However, the first step in any kind of clearing is awareness. And when you start to listen to your language, that is, in my experience, the fastest way to begin to become aware of what it is that's going on in your head about money and what whatever you're saying are things that you're thinking at some level. And so, you know, without hiring a high price healer like myself, which if you have money problems could be an issue, right? Then that's like the easiest, quickest do it yourself way to get started, right? To start becoming aware, see what the issues are, keep a journal, keep a log, you know, even writing about this kind of stuff will help you to identify. But if you start to change your length, I mean, you, you have a choice, right? You can either like what I do is go to the root and get the root issue cleared. And when that's gone, it's like the problem is gone. So then your language changes, your thoughts change, your behavior changes, your attitude, your emotions, all of that naturally change when you resolve it at the source. If you don't have the resources or the, you know, the, the people or whatever it is that you need to get to that, then it's like, well, you can sort of work backwards, kind of like reverse engineering, right? Well, you can start by changing your language and becoming more aware, which is then going to change your thoughts. If you bring your awareness to what you're thinking about and say, wow, that's really not helpful when I say things like X, Y, Z, so I'm going to stop saying those, then you can begin to work backwards from that progress. And I mean, from that point and still see progress from that. Mm. So if, uh, let me see if I get this right. Once you start being careful and and bringing to clarity, okay, here's what's coming out of my mouth. I'm going to choose to say something positive to what I'd like to see in my reality. But then will doing that consistently start to change your feeling? Because what I'm getting here is sometimes I'll try to say something positive or I'm going to be positive, but really inside you're not feeling all that positive. So will that start to shift your current um, emotions and feelings around that? It will. It takes a long time. That's what I'm telling you because it de- yeah. like it's just quicker. And see if you can't tell, I'm very impatient, right? Like yeah. I, I want results now. I want results now. And so that's what my whole mm-hmm. my whole practice that I created, my whole processes were born out of 
that need for, are you kidding? I know what the average lifespan of a person is. Like I can't be clearing the same crap over and over. Like I have to figure out how to get it done quick and make it permanent because I have a lot of stuff that I want to clear. Right. So, and then that evolved into the healing practice that I have today. And I mean, that's why I'm expensive because I get very fast results. So people come to me usually when they've tried other stuff Mm -hmm. that hasn't worked like affirmation. So here's, let's see, this is the easiest way I can explain it. If you, um, if you imagine, I, I don't know, do you do any gardening, Christina? No. No, because you live in New York City, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You can just say New York. I know. Yeah. But <laughs> so, no, you don't, you might have a little like, you know, balcony garden or something, right? But so, you know, you realize people have gardens though, right? In other right. cities and areas. Okay, good. So, and there's these things called weeds. Yeah. Uh, I have to, you know, emphasize that because I live in Colorado. So I don't want you think I'm talking about weed. No, I'm talking about weeds <laughs> sprout up and grow. Right. And so if you cut that weed at the ground level, mm-hmm. which is kind of what you're doing with an affirmation, it grows back and it grows back like thicker and stronger and meaner usually. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you have to keep cutting it and cutting it, and cutting it, and cutting it and cutting it until finally winter comes and there's nothing growing. So you don't have to worry about the weeds. So that's what affirmations are like. You're treating it sort of like at the surface level, but the problem is actually down below the soil. And so, and that's what I figured out. I, I learned, you know, all kinds of stuff like EFT and affirmations and law of attraction and, um, psyche method and all this stuff and Reiki and whatever. And it only took me so far. I I found the stuff kept coming back and that would really frustrate me because I thought, you know, if everything is energy, then there's no reason that I can't figure out how to clear this stuff permanently. Otherwise, I'm going to spend the rest of my life using these practices Mm -hmm. to keep clearing the same crap over and over and over. And so it's kind of like one step forward, two steps back, right? I'm like, I want to get it at the root. Yeah. So if you actually dig down or you use some type of product that goes down to the root of that weed and destroys it at the root, then you can pull it up and be done with it. Well, then you could plant a rose there. You could plant a tree. You could plant an herb garden. You could plant something that you want once that root is gone. But if you don't take care of the root, it just keeps sprouting up. It may not always be visible, but it's still there. So that root cause, let's say it's an old trauma. Let's say it's a past life betrayal. I mean, it could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. It could be something that happened in the womb or during birth or when you were a kid from this lifetime or past, it just will keep sprouting. So it, you know, as many times as you want to skip around it and, you know, pour sunshine and sing songs and, you know, plant berry trees, berry bushes and stuff, that weed is going to keep resurfacing until you get it at the root and then it's gone. And then it's when it's gone, it's gone. You don't have to keep watching it to see, is it coming back? Is it coming back? No, because you know it's gone. So you can move on and say, well, what do I, what would I like to have here instead? And then you can cultivate what it is that you want. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, The only thing I'm wondering, and I'm thinking the audience might wonder too, how do you even begin to discover what your root cause is? And maybe that's what for people like you that can help them with that. Yeah. I mean, that's one way, you know, the other way is some of the stuff that we talked about, right? Like listening to your language. And, um, also I like to look for patterns. I think patterns give us a lot of clues. Um, I will tell you, Christina, nine times out of 10, when somebody comes to me with a problem and they, and I say, how long ago did this start? If, if they've had it their whole life, I got to go looking at past lives, right? Because if they've had it their whole life, it probably didn't come up in this lifetime. But when they say something like, you know, I don't know, it's probably about eight or nine years ago. And I say, what happened eight or nine years ago? I mean, nine times out of 10, that's the trigger. That's the problem. Oh, uh, I met my current spouse or I got divorced or I got fired from this really plum job that I had or, you know, I filed bankruptcy or Um, Or it could even be, it doesn't even have to be anything as earth shattering as the things I just mentioned. It could be, um, I, I broke my leg and I was in the hospital or, you know, I, my dad died or, or, you know, I fell off my bike and my knee never felt right after that. So there's some type of trauma that happened usually, you know, and so 
that's how you can start, right? You can journal about this kind of stuff. Listen to what comes out of your mouth. Let's say you're, let's, okay, so you talked about the letter writing campaign with your partner, right? And you were talking about, and he says, wow, you're a big old Frady cat. And you're like, what? (laughs) And you probably were like, let me see those letters. I want to see what I wrote. Right. But I bet you started noticing just from when he mentioned it, you probably started to notice when those type of fear based words came out of your mouth or and then once you start noticing when they come out of your mouth, you notice them in your head before they even come out of your mouth. Right. Like something somebody calls and you might think, "Uh oh, I hope nothing happened. Right. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. you don't have this conscious sense of fear, but you automatically go to the like, uh oh, kind of phase when a certain person calls you or whatever, like, oh my God, oh my God, it's my kid's school. I hope everything's okay. Right. Like when really it could just be the teacher calling to say, oh, you know, everything's fine. I just wanted to say hi. And can you remind her to send in the library book or whatever. Right. So, um, you start this awareness is where it really begins. Now, usually people will hire me when, They've been working through all the kind of stuff I'm mentioning and they're, they've cleared some of it or they've identified some of it, but they're still hitting like a big block because we do have blind spots around certain things. You know, there's things that we've blocked out from childhood. There's things that we have dismissed because some part of us thinks they're not significant enough to be making an impact, even though they could be the thing that's affecting everything. So we certainly do have blind spots from time to time. But I mean, the best way you can start on your own is by increasing this awareness. And journaling is another way to do that as well, you know, and asking yourself questions like, wow, how long have I been scared using scared language like this? (laughs) Right. Like how long has that been going on? And you might be able to think back to maybe something happened as a kid and you got really scared. You know, maybe one of your parents got really sick and you thought they were going to die. And that's all when it started. All these things that you probably would never connect because either it's so long ago or it seems so insignificant. You know, I, I joke sometimes and say that people that have money issues, they really are shocked when they find out it's from, you know, when they were three and they saved up enough money to get an ice cream cone, took one lick and the ice cream part hit the pavement, right? Oh. And they cry. They would die if they think, no, that can't be the source of all my money problems today. But it really could be wow. something like that. Because if you were three, that ice cream was like your whole freaking world. Oh. You know, it's yeah. like it's like if you wrecked your favorite car that you dreamed about your whole life and you finally got this car today and you wrecked it. That's the equivalent of what that ice cream was like when you were three. So the things that happened when we were kids have a much more, you know, as adults, you think, oh, it's just an ice cream. You can get another one another time. It's no big deal. But to that kid, it could really be devastating. And they could actually make up all these beliefs in that instant as a way of coping with this terrible thing that happened. Wow. Wow, that's that's really fascinating. I really like your your tip on the journaling. That has been something that's been a great benefit to me seeing the patterns in my life and 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 even better when like I told you the letter writing with my partner having someone else read it. Now, not everyone's going to journal and say, hey, read my journal. Um, but those were happened to be letters written, but it was very um, telling to me because when he said that to me, I started to re re analyze or um, Mm -hmm. look at my life and see all the different times I use or say or think or feel fear or or nervousness. And in that year that we met, I made the internal choice to actually challenge every fear that I was scared of. And and that's kind of what launched going forward into learning to fly, to starting my business. So it's interesting that that can really be the catalyst for you breaking out and, and just living your greatest life. I do believe that clarity is what really makes all the difference. You know, that, that is what I stand for. That's what I help people with. And to me, clarity has two pieces. It's on the one hand, it's getting clear, right? It's, it's getting some clarity like you, you could have gone another 10 years without realizing how that fear was present for you. If you hadn't had that situation that mirrored it back to you and offered you the opportunity to take a look and to get some clarity around it. Right. And then the other piece is in terms of clearing the blocks away, right? Like you said, I now challenge every fear. Well, I bet there's some fears Mm -hmm. that are gone the instant you say them, like, I'm afraid I'll melt if I get rained on. You know, you're like, 
that is so dumb. I don't believe that anymore, you know, and, the, and then poof, it's gone. Some th- sometimes you just drag that fear or that belief out into the daylight. And when you see it in the daylight, you know, like when you were a kid and you thought, oh, my God, there's a monster in my closet. Right. And then dad would come in and turn on the lights and you're like, oh, it's a sweater. OK, good. Yeah. You know, it's the same kind of thing. It's like you see it in the daylight. You're like, what? No, I don't believe that. You could just dismiss it. But then there's other stuff that's kind of deeper or is a little more entrenched either because it's been a pattern that's been created or it has some type of emotional trauma around it, you know, like a betrayal or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, where somebody really let you down or, um, or you were caught off guard, like, you know, kind of blindsided that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I get you. Well, this has been so fascinating and, and really a good topic. I'm hoping others listening in, listening in out there will really start to gauge and see the different patterns in their life, start journaling and, and really clear those blocks so they can live their full, greatest, magnificent life in all areas, not just money. But before we head on out, please share with our listeners how, how they can find out more about you, work with you, all that good jazz. Oh, awesome. Well, I really appreciate that. Yeah, my main website is askamyanything.com and you can go on there and sign up to get updates and I let you know when there's cool stuff going on and I usually will do a card pull every month for my uh, that goes with the newsletter so you can kind of see what the energy around the month is going to look like which can be very helpful when you're making different business decisions or kind of like just what to keep an eye out for. And then every Wednesday afternoon on Facebook, you actually can ask Amy anything. I do a 30 minute live Q and a on Facebook where you can just type in your question and I address all of those. That's from four to four 30 Eastern on Wednesdays. And that is at facebook.com slash ask Amy anything. So that's kind of the easiest way to get me. I love that. Ask Amy anything. Perfect. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been awesome having you out here today to ask you all these wonderful questions that hopefully are helping many out there dealing with money mindset questions. So I want to thank you again, Amy, for coming to Savvy Central Radio. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me out. You're welcome. Wednesday, July 15th, 2015, from 6 to 9 p.m., Savvy Central Radio hosts our fourth live interactive business networking event and interview with our guest, national seminar leader and best-selling author, Paul Mlajenovic. Paul shares with us his classic program, Zero Cost Marketing. Come join us for a fun-filled evening with fellow entrepreneurs over light fair and cocktails as you build valuable contents and knowledge. If you're in the New York City area, get your tickets today and come join us at bit.ly.com slash savvy marketing.